Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reveal Report. I'm your host, George Iceman. Thank you for joining us this weekend with another incredible episode. We're going to get into magic wands, a bit of its history and folklore of magic wands and the power that some of them have. We're going to go through some unbelievable things and some information I'm going to uh, share with you that you're going to find possibly shocking. And um, probably many of you did not know some of these things. So I love having these type of interesting shows and topics of conversation. So again, I appreciate you guys being here. Please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we're doing so well. We're just a couple thousand off from getting 40,000 subscribers. Guys, please like, subscribe, share, send to everybody. Let's get it up to 40,000 uh, before the new year. It would be a great thing. And uh, speaking of new year, next week, right here is the Reveal Report two-year anniversary show. Wow. Two years. I'm excited. And our uh, very special guest uh, will be this gentleman right here, Gary Wayne the author of Genesis Conspiracy. So Gary Wayne will be our guest with me and Jesse next week for the two-year anniversary show. I hope you can join us. Again, follow us on Twitter at The Reveal Report, on Instagram at The Reveal Report, and on Telegram at The Reveal Report. So uh, we appreciate you guys being here. And without further ado, let's get started. Please welcome my co-host, Miss Jesse Zaboder. Jesse, how hey. are you? Good. Good to be here, George. We got an Jesse, exciting show tonight. Magic wands. Are they real? Are they not real? Is it folklore? Did you use a wand? Did I use a wand? And a lot Good of question. images, right, with, with magic wands are usually a magician. And he's got his wand over his hat and, you know, he makes things mysteriously appear and disappear for manifestation. It's like power. But where did that idea come from? How did the imagery of a magician with a magic wand come into play? We're going to get into that, Jesse. And one of the key things when you're speaking about magic wands that comes to mind is this show, or I should say movie, Harry Potter. And what an interesting poster uh, because they are at war, magician versus magician, uh, and they don't have guns or bows or arrows or bombs or fire, but instead they're using magic wands. And at a very young age, they begun this indoctrination. And Jesse, did you know they even have different styles of wands that they sell? Here you go. Harry Potter, the wand collection. Isn't that interesting? That is. I could tell you all about the different styles, George. Um, Jesse, it's a humorous Just, story. <laughs> please share with us a story about a magic wand. Well, I was, I love knitting and crocheting and, you know, working with yarn. And I was on Etsy one time and I was looking for knitting needles and I saw these, I mean, they were the most beautiful needles I thought I'd ever found. And I was like, wow, these are so cool. And I was like, you know, like, like, like putting them in my cart. Then I went to order one. And realized there was only one. And I was like, why is there only one knitting needle? You need two. Ended up, I had put a whole bunch of witches' wands in my cart. <laughs> wow. So that's my funny little story. Now, wait a minute, Jesse. Th these are actual wands of witches? They were. Yes, they were selling them. Yeah. Wow. Now, for those that are new here, uh, many of you know your, your backstory and your testimony, but for those that are new, Jesse comes from a background, uh, a bloodline of, of a family that was involved in uh, rituals and magic and uh, Satanism. Um, so I'd like to maybe give you the floor for a couple of moments to share if you ever witnessed any type of magic with wands yourself. Did you ever participate in anything or heard stories in your circles of anything magical with wands? I did see them used, um, but usually it was by uh, those that were considered lower level or mid-level witches or warlocks. Um, to be honest, at the highest levels, um, you know, especially dealing with the Solomonic or the Enochian, 
um, or thalemic magic, they do not use wands uh, for different spells. Um, even in my training in the military uh, with high level witches and warlocks, they never used wands either. Mm. Uh, the only time I did witness them, uh, again, was with the lower mid-level witches and warlocks. And usually that was in regards to one of my teachers, Lori Cabot Kent, um, who does still to this day uh, make as well as supply and distribute witches' wands through her stores. Interesting. Now, she supplies them. She would make them. Um, interesting story about that. In magic, um, or the level that of magic that I was in, um, there were, we, there's no wands just so everyone understands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I dealt with, you know, hoodoo, folklore magic, uh, even uh, when I started getting into Solomonic magic um, with King Solomon, there was not yeah, a, what, no what I was doing, zero wands. The only magic that I'm aware of um, that uses an actual wand is from this gentleman right here, and it's Wicca. And Gerald... Um, Gardner is his name, actually, also known by the craft name Squire, was an English Wiccan, as well as an author and an amateur autobiographist and uh, archaeologist. And he's a bit of a wild cat, this guy. Hmm. He, he was into sex magic and orgies and uh, all kinds of weird things. And there's a claim that he was doing magic with witches during uh, Hitler's um, uh, attempted uh, attack on England. And uh, some people actually passed away uh, from spells that they were doing for, you know, hours and hours hmm. and hours, some say days on end. But that's the only particular magic uh, that 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 I'm aware of that actually uses a wand and it's Wicca, which is on a, a different level and it's more you would call maybe you know the light system or natural magic, yeah, light could, side magic, yeah, you know, or you, white you, magic, yeah. So and they're doing that now. Even in these levels of magic, it it's not just get a piece of wood. It's not that easy. There is still a ritual not. to that. I, and I think that's why Lori Cabot Kent, you know, makes those because she's somebody, she does her own books, uh, like, you know, Book of Shadows and the Necra uh, Comic Con, all of those. So I think it's, you know, part of, there's very few people who actually know how to make those. Yeah. And like you said, they have to be very specialized. So why don't you share with us why, how they make them? Yeah. So it, it will be a process of per, like, It'll be a particular type of wood, number one. And depending on the spell or the magic you're going to conduct, um, it, it could be a different wood from a different tree. So particular wood from a particular tree, always key. Cut on a certain day at a certain time. So it's not even going to a tree. I got to go to the, get a magic wand and you go there. Again, this is all coming from ancient grimoires, which uh, is also known as journals. And these go back hundreds to thousands of years. And yes, it is made of wood. And it must be cut from that tree on a certain day, during a certain moon, or a certain time period in order for it to work or manifest. Um, it gets a little bit more elaborate um, in the uh, Wicca style when they start adding certain stones to magnify its power. So the stone could be a stone from one place um, and it's added to a particular wood on a certain day. Even the stone, guys, I can't make this up. This is real. I did this. Even the stone must be purified under the sun in a certain type of water during a certain time. That's, that's, I, I, I did that myself you know, on, when I, that's in the lower levels. So well, they will in the higher levels, they'll sometimes, um, Oh, they do that know, as well. That's the mid levels, but they'll put their, um, rings that have their stones, their particular stones in them. So yes. they'll put that like around the bottom and, and stack up their rings on their wands as well. So there you go. It, it's a particular style. And, I find it interesting that in today's generation, you know, they are bringing back the magic wand. And I was like very fascinated with this, that Harry Potter was that 
particular movie. And again, they teach you about battle mm -hmm. and doing warfare with the wand. I'm going to share a clip from one of the Harry Potter uh, movies so you can understand it, it's not in a funny way, but it's in a powerful way. So take a look at this. Two. Rick the Sempra! They're trying to hurt each other there, Jesse. Yeah. With these and they actually, what's even sadder is that they actually have training centers like this in the United States and across the world where they actually are, you know, doing this type of training with children and teaching them these things. It's unbelievable. And again, uh, you'll see magic wands everywhere in the world, the power of the magic wand. You'll, you'll see it, like I said, in Wicca. Uh, you'll see it in Harry Potter. And another place you'll see a magic wand, again, symbolizing power, symbolizing strength, authority, will be in a conductor. And I'll show you a quick clip of a conductor in his orchestra showing and yielding the power of his wand. He conducts everything with that wand. That's his power. It's not called a, a stick. It's <laughs> not called um, a, a, a staff, actually, but it is called a wand. And as you can see, he controls that. It's very, very yeah. interesting because... That, that metals are... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go ahead. Metals are... Uh, you've got, with energy flow, you have conductors as well. A thousand so percent. The, the name is... is reminiscent of what's happening, that there's energy being controlled. Another place um, that you'll see wands, and it's a different style of wand. That could be a scepter, it could be a staff, and it's in ancient Egypt, hieroglyphs, photos, uh, sculpting in the wall on actual stone. And if you take a look at this, here is one of the pharaohs, and, I, and there's hundreds you could find. And it says, was scepter a symbol of power? So that's the topic for a moment, Jesse. Let's get into that. Did the scepter actually represent power, or did it also have some type of magical ability, some type of magical um, power to it, to manifest things, to do things, to create miracles. What are your thoughts? Ancient Egypt, um, did these pharaohs have power? Were they metal rods? Were they made of stone or were they made of wood? What are your thoughts on that, Jesse? Actually, I did see scepters used quite often by the very top level individuals. In fact, um, the old guard mother of darkness before my proctor took that position, she was known for using a scepter and it had a big red jewel on the top and she would use it um, to conduct power. Uh, you know, where I, I saw her take out people with it wow. um, as she'd control the energy flow. Um, they also would use it. Um, it was usually a sign of their rule, their reigning, uh, but the highest level wizards or warlocks uh, were also known for having uh, that type of scepter. Mm -hmm. um, not all of them would put jewels or things on the top of it. Um, you know, most of them would just have what looked like a plain wood staff that they would use. Now, let me ask you, Jesse, sometimes, you know, they would put the jewels like you said, but mm -hmm. in 
some cultures, did the jewels just represent power of riches or did the actual Jews themselves, because I'm under the impression from what I've learned, that the actual jewels or stones that are used are conductors of energy and have power and that magnifies the magic uh, that more. Uh, are you aware of this? Yes. Um, actually, the cut of the stone is um, how the jewel is amplified. So mm -hmm. um, I've talked about that with diamonds before. Um, you know, if it's just got a simple cut, you're going to have a lot of energy flow going through it quickly. Uh, but the more complicated jewels, um, that's what they use for interdimensional use or transferring that power interdimensionally, uh, which is kind of how sa satellites work as well. Mm -hmm. And they're able to align some of that use of the energy flow with those satellites even to... Uh, to make their energy go long distance. Wow. It, it really is unbelievable. Magic wands, the power, the folklore, the history. We're getting, we're getting into it, folks. This is some amazing yeah. stuff. Of course, we're we're saving the best for last, the big finale. And before I get into or you know the original magic wand i believe the folklore behind it the the history behind it even occultically hidden a lot of people have no idea um uh, i'm i'm referring to moses's staff but i don't want to go there just yet because it, it, it's serious stuff when we get into that but there's other and i shared this with you jesse and a lot of people are going to be shocked but there's ancient paintings found in Churches, caves, old locations. And let me share with you some of these. Now, Jesse, who do you think that is with that wand, magic staff or stick in the front? Who do you think that is? Who do you think it's referring to in the paintings? That's interesting. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but... yeah. I would, I would say probably Jesus or Peter. Correct. Here's another one. This one is said to be Jesus. And it's ancient. This is very old Christian art. But for whatever reason, they were depicting him with a wand. Now, I believe the left picture is him with Lazarus. And on the right, do you remember during the wedding party, I believe he did the miracle of wine mm -hmm. and so forth. But so these are the depictions of the miracles in the Bible. However, there are scholars uh, that are saying and depicted this with, with artists. This is old Christian art found in underground caves and, and, and churches mm -hmm. to be Jesus. Now, I, I can't find in a... In the Bible, I'm trying to, where they mention it. But then again, the Bible is just one book of many scrolls and many that have been hidden from the public. There are many things that have been written that we're not supposed to know about. So what are your thoughts on this? Why would these artists of ancient depict Jesus with a magic wand? What are they trying to say here? What are your thoughts on that, Jesse? Yeah, it's very curious. Um... You know, I still say we have to validate, you know, who they're depicting, but that's, you know, the story. And we know that artists um, sometimes take liberties. So it's hard to know if it's, you know, based off of what they really witnessed or saw or heard, uh, because that's how most of the older artists, you know, who depicted things during the scriptural times um, they would draw their art based on the stories that they heard or were being passed down. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to know, you know, if that person, you know, we know in that culture that there was a lot of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any documentation either or um, other evidence to show that, you know, they used wands particularly during that time. Uh -huh. There is things, you know, especially out of Egypt where we know, 
that definitely staffs or rods were used, um, but nothing quite that, you know, talks about the shorter wand type sticks being used in magic. So, um, it, but, it, but it's curious. I mean, you know, these pictures, they can validate the date or around, you know, the times of the dates around when these were drawn. Uh -huh. So, you know, we have to add that to the puzzle pieces for sure. 100%. I'm just fascinated with this and these ancient photos that are being drawn. Um, again, it is the artist's perception. But can we also add possibly, just maybe, Jesse, another theory that these artists that had the privilege and opportunity to write on these walls could have possibly belonged to a private society. That's possibly a good possibility. A yeah. special group that would have occultic knowledge on something. Is that a possibility? I think that's a high possibility that it could have been added in by artist Liberty uh, based on their own witchcraft practices. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is absolutely incredible um, that we could find these type of pictures, this type of art that's out there. We have Wicca that uses it. We have um, Harry Potter. We have magicians commercially. Um, we have the Egyptians and the pharaohs that use it. Um, in, in royalty, there is, of course, the royal staff. It's part of their anointing. They receive it. Tell us a little bit about that, the staff, or what you know about it. You know, Queen Elizabeth has one. Uh, is it a special staff, particularly because of the rocks, jewels, and stones that's placed to it? What are your thoughts on that? Um, from my understanding, it is the usually the initially the type of wood, mm -hmm. um, the jewels, the the rings, everything that would be added to that uh, crystals are just going to be added to amplify the power that they believe that staff already has. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, throughout the Old Testament, we see particularly Moses, but there are others um, who had staffs and. The staffs were associated with great miracles or, you know, the unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so even in the book of Exodus, we see this, you know, fight between um, the priests of Pharaoh uh -huh. and Moses and Aaron. And uh, they're using their staffs in that battle to as a display of who whose God is powerful or more powerful. It's unbelievable stuff where else do we see wands jesse everywhere let's talk about those of the ruling class those that were physicians judges magicians the ruling class i'm referring to are the druids this was a very powerful bunch of people ladies and gentlemen the druids go back a very long time a druid was a member of the high-ranking class in ancient Celtic cultures. Druids were religious leaders as well as legal authority. They were lore keepers, medical professionals, and political advisors. Druids, however, never left no written accounts. So they were not like the old day witches to leave grimoires because I believe they would think it would give up their power. Occultically, teaching that knowledge and passing it forward, this was a special class of people. And Jesse, these druids would have magic wands and they would have scepters. Mm -hmm. And these scepters... And the wood that these ancient druids would use came from a particular tree. And it became very well known as the tree of magic. And I'll share that tree with you 
It was the Hollywood yep. from the holly tree. And the wood of this tree in this area where it grew would be cut and used for the Druid's magic wand or staff. And thus, they called this place Hollywood, where all the magic happens. And that's because the magic happens from the holly tree used by the Druids to conduct their rituals and manifestation and so forth. So if you did not know where Hollywood's name came from, there it is, from the there Hollywood you know. tree. The holly tree where the Druids would create their wands and staffs. Interesting stuff, Jesse. The Druids. Definitely. We go down the line, Jesse. It's right there in front of us. But where originally do we know about this power? Where is the original magic wand? That's what everybody wants to know. And this is what I feel is the Pierre de la Resistance. Now, my French isn't very good, but you get the gist. <laughs> Moses's staff. And this is all over the Bible. It is written. The miracles he created. Here's another photo of him parting the seas. Here's another one when he went to battle, the great war, and they held him up. There's power in that wand. There's power in that staff. And I'm going to play a quick video I found. The first one I'll play is from a very popular movie, The Ten Commandments. So take a look, listen carefully, and watch what happens. Who is this God that I should let your people go? Aaron, pass down my staff before Pharaoh, that he may see the power of God. In this you shall know that the Lord is God. One clip, we're going to get more into it. I'm going to share a clip of a gentleman who did some, he did a really good job on narrating some of the miracles that Moses uh, did in the Bible. So I'm going to play that for you. And then we're going to dissect this a little bit. I'm going to share some very interesting things with you. So here it is. Take a listen. This is just one of many stories in the Torah of Moses using his staff to perform a miracle. Exodus 14, verses 15 through 21. And Yahweh said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites so that they set out. And you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it so that the Israelites can go in the middle of the sea on the dry land. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh moved the sea with a strong east wind all night, and he made the sea become dry ground, and the waters were divided. While the Israelites are out in the desert, the Amalekites, a tribe that inhabited the Negev, swept in to attack them. Exodus 17 verses 8 through 13 reads, And Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us, and go out, fight against Amalek tomorrow. I will be standing on the top of the hill, and the staff of God will be in my hand. And Joshua did as Moses had said to him, to fight with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And when Moses raised his hand, Israel would prevail. But when he rested his hand, Amalek would prevail. But the hands of Moses were heavy, and they took a stone and placed it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on each side, and his hands were steady until sundown. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So the success of the Israelites in battle was tied to the power of Moses' staff. And what's important to note is that Yahweh did not command Moses to oversee the battle in this way. It was Moses' idea and he was assisted by Aaron and Hur, and ultimately Joshua and his army prevailed with the aid of the staff. 
Now, I'm going to add, it's important, um, especially when you're doing the reading in the scripture, that there seems to be a little conflict uh, in stories about Aaron and the staff. Did Moses and Aaron share the same staff or were there two staffs? Aaron had one, Moses had the other. Now, the folklore story you hear is that Moses was a shepherd and the staff was just a piece of wood that he got for the sheep. But, ladies and gentlemen, occultically, that's actually not the story. Mm -hmm. Occultically, there is power to Moses' staff. You see, occultically, it is said that that staff was actually created at the beginning of creation on the sixth day. It was given to Adam, the first human being who held it and had it. And that was passed on generationally to those high up in power until the time of Moses where it was given to him. This staff was also referred to as, and depending on how you um, do its translation, the rod of God. You may have heard that phrase mm -hmm. in other places. I've heard that phrase. Now you know where it comes from, the rod of God. Now Moses, biblically, when you read these stories, he knew that this had power, this rod. Now I can share with you this that after tons of research and digging, it is said that they have found this staff. And it is said to be in Istanbul, Turkey, with certain artifacts, religious relics that also belong to Muhammad. I mean, this is what they're saying right. in Istanbul, Turkey. What I can share with you is after doing research, there is certain ancient relics that are there in this building. And there is a staff. I, however, do not feel it's Moses' staff. But somebody claims to have seen it, the real staff. Someone claims to have possession of it, a group. And the person I'm referring to is Jafar al-Sadiq. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jafar al-Sadiq and share a image of who he looks like. This is Jafar al-Sadiq. Now, he was commonly known and was in the 8th century Shia Muslim scholar. He was a Shia Muslim scholar. He created a program of teaching. He was the founder of the school of Islamic uh, scripture. And he has a lot to do with what I'm about to say. Because in books, his claim is that his people, the Shia Muslim hierarchy have the actual tablets of the Ten Commandments. They actually have the real staff of Moses that is passed on in their bloodline because it was his people. It is said it is to be passed on to the new Messiah. And the new Messiah will have this wand, this rod of God of power. Now he says that I've claimed he has visually seen it. And Jesse, he says it's as green as the day it was plucked from the tree. Interesting. Green. Which means that it's young wood or living wood. Correct. Yeah. Now that's the unknown kind of occultic information that hmm. a lot of people won't know about. 
But that is what they say about Moses' wand. Was it given to him by God? Was it actually created, as it said, on the sixth day of creation, given to Adam, passed on? Is this Muslim brotherhood, this Muslim bloodline, they are said to be the procurers of this and have it. And it'll only be shown publicly and given to their Messiah when the time has come. Mm -hmm. So I think what scripture are your says, I think scripture says that Moses um, got that on the mountain from God as he was coming down or it was while well, he was in the cave um, after seeing the tree um, that was on fire. And it was specifically given for him as a sign and a display for miracles. So that's a really interesting study to look at, you know, his staff and why God um, even allowed him to use that before Israel. And we know that um, a lot of Pharaoh's court, uh, a lot of the ancient kings, Pharaohs would all have magicians or what we now call witches or warlocks as their advisors in their court. And um, one of the other interesting things about that is that um, it actually connects in scripture to uh, the Hebrew word for, um, it actually translated into the Greek, uh, is the only begotten son. Uh, that word begotten um, can mean like a sliver or a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. um, so that then connects some of those Old Testament stories, you know, as a uh, type of the things that were to come with Jesus Christ and, you know, his victories over things. Um, so it gets, you know, it's a really interesting study. And, um, you know, you also have, you know, scripture says that that staff budded and, uh, that it was one of the three items that was placed into the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Which is so if Aaron and Moses' staff were one in the same, mm -hmm. then we'd have to ask, well, how did they get it out of the Ark of the Covenant? Because Correct. only a Levitical priest can remove that. And the tablets that. as well. And it is said yeah. to be in possession of the these Shia Muslims, the these uh, this hierarchy, uh, very powerful. They said it, it's their ancestral power. It's their bloodline. They It's theirs. And it is said that they have it. They have it in their possession, and we will see it when their that's Messiah comes. Possible. So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, possible. it's very interesting. You, you mentioned it biblically about how it's mentioned. I mean, especially specifically in the book of Daniel. When you read yeah. Daniel, you will see they refer to magicians and sorcerers, mm -hmm. fortune tellers, and so forth. And um, they mention it frequently in the Bible, uh, magicians yeah. and sorcerers. They're there. Uh, and uh, the power of the magic wand, how ancient is it? And it seems that the first one is uh, depicted is Moses. However, if you go on the occult occult information, that particular staff existed before Moses. Mm -hmm. And that's why it had so much power. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What a topic of conversation. We could go on for a very long time with different scenarios. Yeah, but Great we, topic tonight. We hope all of you watching enjoyed it, appreciate it, and um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that with you uh, and learn something from it. Jesse, before we sign off, uh, anything you want to say in closing and where can people follow your ministry? Absolutely. Um, you can follow my ministry on two websites. Uh, the first is illuminatethedarkness.com. And that's um, the portion of our ministry where we help support uh, champions, veterans, and uh, survivors who are whistleblowers. So I encourage you to check that out at Illuminate the Darkness. Uh, you can go to .com or .online, which is um, our Netherlands connection. And then you can also follow me on KingdomLivingWithJesse.com. And uh, for that, if you, I encourage you to check that out. I've got lots of great videos on there uh, with good topics that help you to uh, to work at 
on that topic of kingdom living. There you go. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you appreciate the show and you want to join in for a special Q&A after show, we're going to be live right after this on Patreon. Me and Jesse will go back and forth. We'll talk about this topic or you watching might have some questions for myself or Jesse. You want to talk about it? So feel free. Join us. The link is in the description. I appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, if you want to support the show and you appreciate the work uh, that's put in to keep this going here on YouTube, please, um, you know, show your love and support by going to paypal.me forward slash George Iceman. Again, that's paypal.me forward slash George Iceman. The link is in the description. I thank you all for watching. Remember next week, two year anniversary, Jesse, me, you and Gary. Right. We're going to get biblical and one particular topic we're going to touch on is Melchizedek and the Good mystery topic. behind Melchizedek. Get ready. Get your popcorn. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen. Remember to get outside, get some fresh air, get some vitamin D. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, give glory, grace, and praise to God Almighty. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good night.